Hi there, and welcome to the first edition of Network News from the Real Agenda Network. I'm Tom Burgess, and thanks for joining us today. And we're keen to know what you think of this show, so do uh, drop us a line. There's details further on, and we'll uh, hope to hear from you. So this news bulletin will highlight the news and the good work being carried out by determined campaign groups within the Real Agenda Network. And it's those organisations working hard to bring social and economic change where prosperity, which we all help to create, is shared by all, not just the few. Now, each bulletin will be news and updates on the urgent campaigns to reduce inequality and build a fairer society, with themes covering compassion, homelessness, tax reform, minimum income standards, economic justice, inequality, climate change, democracy, and even more. And it's about fixing these fundamental problems and what we can do to end the unnecessary financial hardship that's suffered by millions every day. Because that's the Real Agenda. And you can find out more at realagenda.org or you can contact us at info at realagendaradio.org. Now we know that we can achieve great change if we work together. So that's what we're doing here on the Real Agenda Network. We're building a partnership of proactive campaign groups and think tanks and researchers, which to date have got a collective online following of over 700,000. And now the Real Agenda Network also distributes podcasts from these particular groups. So we're very pleased to welcome to the network Compass, which campaigns for a good society, Compassion in Politics, Extinction Rebellion, Institute of Public Policy Research, New Economics Foundation, Tax Justice Network, Taxpayers Against Poverty, the Equality Trust, the Forgiveness Project, and Unlock Democracy. So reading the news to you will be me, Tom Burgess, but I will be joined in later bulletins by my good friend Jennifer Nadel, former ITN Home Affairs Editor and now the founder of Compassion in Politics, a very worthwhile organisation of which I'm pleased to be involved, and we'll hear more about that in just a moment. So in this bulletin, it'll just be me behind the desk. But, you know, wait, there's some good stuff coming up, so do stay tuned. So on with the news this week. So first up, Compassion in Politics. Yes, there's a new Compassion Academy. We'll be offering a range of bespoke compassion and well-being interventions and courses for leaders, organisations, campaigns and individuals. As we just said, it's set up by the campaigning group Compassion in Politics, And the first course from the Compassion Academy is a masterclass in self-compassion, which the organisers say will give you practical tools to help you silence your inner critic, build resilience and feel compassion both inwardly and outwardly. The class is delivered by Jennifer Nadel, who, as I just mentioned, is co-founder of Compassion in Politics and also works with organisations and individuals across the world to integrate compassion into all aspects of life and work. Jennifer says the session will introduce you to the practice of self-compassion, which has a vital role to play during this period of great uncertainty. So if you want to find out more about this and the work of Compassion in Politics, go go to CompassionInPolitics.com. Now, Unlock Democracy are calling on the government to bring forward a new devolution bill which gives power back to local communities, and they posted a new petition for which they're seeking signatures. Now, Unlock Democracy recently hired ex-MP Tom Brake as Executive Director, and uh, we spoke to him in a recent episode of The Real Agenda. Now, Tom said it's time to end the Whitehall-led, one-size-fits-all approach that's often led to failure and waste. Decisions about the kind of support local businesses need to recover from the pandemic should be taken in town halls, not White Halls. He added that local councils understand the needs of their most vulnerable residents better than anyone sitting in an office in Whitehall. So you can find out more about that and the petition on unlockdemocracy.org.uk. Now, we would be mentioning Compass anyway, but it's very kind of Neil Lawson, the director of Compass, to put in a good word for us. And he said uh, the Real Agenda Network provides a unique platform for progressive ideas and debate at a moment when they never be more critical. So thanks for that, Neil. Now, that's enough about us. Let's get back to Compass. A Compass, which continue, is continuing with its series of podcasts called It's Bloody Complicated, 
is moving now to fortnightly calls. Compass members can join these live recordings and bring questions to the guests. The hosts, Neil Lawson and Francis Foley, will be speaking to thinkers, writers, politicians on, and how to build a good society. It's good stuff. Listen to it. In the most recent episode, Francis um, is joined by Peter McFadden, who ha- has inspired the flat pack democracy movement, and also Indra Adnan, one of the co-founders of the new political advocates, the Alternative UK. And for those of you that didn't know, flat pack democracy is not a, a spin-off from IKEA, but an independent movement which started in Frome, Somerset, inspired by the frustration with missed opportunities and the way that local government usually works. I can fully understand that, as I spent four years on a parish council once, luckily not all in the same meeting. Since then, the group has taken control of the local council and inspired similar groups in other towns across the UK. You can find out more about that on flatpackdemocracy.co.uk. And the Alternative UK is a political platform, and it says, through curation, editorial, public events, commissioning and research, it aims to transform the language and practice of politics. Now, it's inspired and, and by and associated with Alternivet in Denmark. It's trying to bring about a friendly revolution. You can find out more at thealternative.org.uk. And I had the pleasure of meeting the co-founder Indra a couple of times and we even recorded an interview with her, which I admit we've actually not used yet, but maybe sometime soon. Or maybe we'll need to do that do that interview again, Indra. But anyway, all the best. Now, the more information about becoming a Compass member and the podcast series, go to compassonline.org.uk. So moving on, Nobel Peace Prizes. Nobel Peace Prizes, should we say. A lot of us campaign hard because we want to do the right thing. But sometimes it feels like beating your head against a brick wall when politicians fail to grasp how they could help bring about the changes we all do desperately want to see. So a bit of recognition on your achievements on the way is a really good boost. And that's just what's happened with the international tax justice movement because it's just been recognised in a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize from three Norwegian politicians. The nomination is shared by the Global Alliance for Tax Justice and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Now, the Global Alliance for Tax Justice was spun out of the Tax Justice Network in 2013 as the umbrella body of mass mobilisation organisations working on tax justice around the world. And the Tax Justice Network was formally established in 2003 and began to build a global network of experts and civil society organisations. And the two organisations continue to collaborate closely on the annual State of Tax Justice report, which last November re- revealed that the world is losing over $427 billion in tax to tax havens every year, the equivalent of one nurse's annual salary lost every second. Tax Justice Network Chief Executive Alex Cobham was over the moon. The global pandemic has exposed glaring inequalities and shortfalls in revenues to fund both public health systems and economic protection, he said. The United Nations and its leading member states should ensure that the panel's recommendation, the fruits of the organisations now deservedly nominated for the Nobel, are delivered with all urgency. And just for your information, the UK arm of the Tax Justice Network is Tax Justice UK, led by Robert Palmer, who's often on the uh, Real Agenda Network, and also Tax Justice have their own podcast, which is great to listen to, called Taxcast. And Robert's achieved some great, considerable process, progress in outlining the faults in our the UK tax system and how it could be fixed more equitably. I'm pleased to be involved in this work as, as one of the team of technical advisors. And so I'm particularly keen to highlight the work that they're doing. You can find out more at taxjustice.net. In later bulletins, we'll be hearing the latest news also from the Equality Trust, the IPPR, the New Economics Foundation, Extinction Rebellion, plus brief clips and comments from those in the know. So that's the news for this week, but let's just have another aspect of the news. And this is like monitoring some of the things that have been in the media that are worth a closer examination and that may point us in the direction of how we can achieve positive change for all. Now here's a piece we picked up online from Wired about technology and innovation. It resonates with me particularly as I spent 30 plus years marketing technology companies 
as well as living in Silicon Valley for a year, and that was a great experience. So I've seen a lot of innovation, uh, but that's a story for another day. Now, it's often thought that innovation comes from the creative minds of entrepreneurial geniuses. But does it? Actually, the majority of technological innovations have come from state-funded research. And so that indicates where government should put the effort in if we want a high-performing economy with high productivity generating wealth for all, not just the few. As an example, in the USA, the development of Google's search algorithm, for instance, had been supported by a grant from the National Science Foundation. The electric car company Tesla initially struggled to secure investment until it received a $465 million loan, dollar loan from the US Department of Energy. In fact, three companies founded by Elon Musk, Tesla, SolarCity and SpaceX, have jointly benefited from nearly $4.9 billion in public support of various kinds. In her 2013 book, The Entrepreneurial State, Mariana Mazzucatu argues that the United States' economic success is a result of public and state-funded investments in innovation and technology rather than the result of the small-state free market doctrine that often receives the credit for the country's strong economy. According to a study by Mariana and economist Bill Lazenick, between 2003 and 2013, publicly listed companies in the S&P 500 index use more than half their earnings to buy back shares to boost stock prices. And we know what happens if they do that. It boosts top executive remuneration, which is often based on share price, rather than investing it back into further research and development. Pharmaceutical company Pfizer, for example, which we've heard a lot about recently, spent $139 billion on share buybacks. Apple, who has never engaged in this type of financial engineering under the co-founder Steve Jobs, started doing so in 2012. And by 2018, he'd spent nearly, they'd spent nearly $1 trillion on share buybacks. As Mariana says, these profits could be used to fund research and training for workers, but instead they're often used on share buybacks and golfing. So what can we do? Well, states could invest in innovation... But don't give away all the intellectual property. Make sure the government retains a share on behalf of the nation and that in return a sizable amount of shares are owned by the state, maybe in a sovereign fund which will benefit all citizens, not just the few. Now how would you like it if your pay was doubled? Well, it is now. This is not a dream. It could be the case. But unfortunately, half your pay has gone to the 1%. In a recent episode of Pitchfork Economics podcast, Carter Price, a senior mathematician at the RAND Corporation, discussed a new report from RAND's researchers which found that $2.5 trillion is redistributed from the bottom 90% of Americans to the wealthiest 1% of Americans every year. The median college-educated American worker would have been seen their annual pay doubled if it wasn't for this theft. So if it feels like you're working harder for less money than your parents' or grandparents' generation, that's because you are. And that's not just America. Evidence shows that it's repeated around the world, and we will bring you more on that in later bulletins. And thanks very much to Business Insider for most of the content of this story. So that's about it for this week. Thank you very much indeed for listening. What did you think? Contact us on inforrealagendaradio.org or via our website, realagenda.org. We'd love to hear your views, and if you're polite, you could receive a signed copy of my book, From Here to Prosperity. We hope that we'll help, we've will helped to inform, involve, and inspire you into action. But do let us know what you think. We want to get this show just right so that it's informative, and you'll enjoy listening to it every episode. So what's up next on the Real Agenda Network? Well, one of the things here, we're really excited that more and more people are listening to the Real Agenda Network over recent months, and there's plenty to choose from. We've already mentioned the various organisations who have shows on this channel and you can subscribe on all the main podcast providers. So please do. Special thanks to our sponsors, the Reverse Media Group, one of the fastest growing search and media companies. Find out why at reversemediagroup.com. Now one thing is certain, people want to see change to a more compassionate and just society, as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing 
for people over party. Now, it's not happening, but it can, it's urgent, and it's up to us to make it happen. Because that's the real agenda. I'm Tom Burgess, and thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.